everyone. Welcome to this uh, Q&A session with um, Michel van der Loef uh, from Guerrilla Games, the technical Close director enough. of um, of the technology behind the um, acclaimed uh, game Horizon Zero Dawn and many others. So uh, please give a round of applause to Michel. Um, all right. So. Um, your career started with a, um, I, I think that from the research I've done, it started with a game that um, I personally loved very much as a kid, Just Jack Rabbit 2, back uh, in 1998. So, uh, <laughs> are there any other fans in the in the room of that game? Yeah, see, yeah, yeah. see, people still remember that. Do you even know that the game still has an active community that actually mods the game and still creates levels for them and organizes online tournaments? Yes, I do. I've actually seen that people have been creating a JavaScript version and Node.js version of it and recreated the level editor in the web page. Um, so yeah, I've seen the community. It's really cool to see there's so much love for it. I actually got two interview requests for this conference and both of them said, like, can we ask something about jazz? I was like, <laughs> sure. So, um, so um, could, could you maybe like, so if there's so much interest in that game, could you maybe like, Tell, give a, tell us a word or two about um, how that came around and w what you actually did on that on that project. That um, maybe to condense a very long story into a slightly different, slightly less long story. I think that was my entry in the games industry. Um, I think there was uh, a demo disc from the Future Crew. They had this um, yeah, demo disc with like a, a scene magazine with like information, and there was a, a guy in Holland, and he was creating a game for Epic Mega Games, and he said like, you know, if you know how to code, like, you know, give me a call. And I was like 16 and doing assembly and stuff at the time. Um, I met that guy. He introduced me, brought me to America, and there I met Cliff Blazinski, who was like running around like a mad kid. It was like, um, and then we met up with the rest of the team. I think it was like five of us or something. Um, and basically, that's how we s I started coding uh, for games. And I think it was like 16 when I started, maybe 18 when it's done. Uh, you, d you don't get stories like that anymore <laughs> <laughs> with people starting like at 16 in the industry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or finishing a game in two years. But <laughs> <laughs> Cool, cool. I am a huge fan of that game. I, I still play it sometimes. Um, so um, I introduced you as a technical director and knowing how the industry likes to obsess over job titles. Um, maybe you could mm, also tell us a little bit about what actually being a technical director entails at Guerrilla Games. Uh, yeah, so Guerrilla is a studio in uh, Amsterdam, for those who don't know it, we're about 200 and I think we just finished Horizon Zero Dawn, we were 230 people there. Um, I think when we finished Kills on Shadowfall, we were like 210, so we went from a first person shooter uh, to an open world game. We uh, scaled up slightly, but not massively. I think maybe our outsourcing was a little bit bigger. Um, we have, of the 230 people at peak, there were 65 programmers. I think we've gone down a little bit now to 210. Some people leave because projects finished and stuff. Um, and none of the coders have left, so are still like about 65 programmers. They're in seven, eight different teams. So there's the tech, like rendering and, uh, and sound and memory allocation, that sort of low-level stuff. Uh, game tech, which is like game entities, uh, networking systems, um, sequencers, so like all of the, 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 the sort of like the engine technology that makes it a game engine instead of like a, instead of just a rendering engine. Um, there's game code, that's the biggest code team, 14 guys, AI code, uh, tools team, infrastructure, that's like all the pure force and stuff and everything. Okay. And I, so if you are, so you are in charge of all those people? Yes, yeah, and you make wow. it sound. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't feel that way. I mean, you know, I still code quite a lot, and that means, like, I, I have a lot of, like, management overhead, like, you know, meetings and stuff with the management and with all the creative direction because I want to know what the engine can do and if we can do this. And then I spend my Fridays, basically, uh, half an hour each. I talk to all of the different leads, so in the morning I just walk, like, circles around the office drinking coffee and talking to everybody. So that's how I keep up with all of my leads, make sure that, like, everybody's sort of aligned. So I do a lot of, like management by walking around and drinking coffee. Um, and as much time as I can, I try to do coding. Um, and it differs a little bit. There's like times when there's crunch and I'm not, I don't really, I like doing 
engine bits code and low-level systems, but I don't actually have a particular affinity, although, and I really like tools, but I'm, you know, I suck too much to be a graphics coder because you have to be really, really, spend all your time doing it, otherwise you're not gonna, so I do, do a lot of like, uh, GPU profiling and stuff, so like help analyze because the tech team is busy improving the engine and I get to help out and just like do analysis and, um, you know, when I get the time I write UI code for the editor and, um, cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to get back to that UI editor. <laughs> um, Horizon Zero Dawn, um, it is uh, beyond doubt a quite spectacular technical achievement. Um, if you could sum the, the project up in one word, what would that word be and why? I should have prepared these questions. <laughs> um, uh, well, it can be a, little, a few more words if that makes it easier. I think it was like, I would say like mad ambition. We, we did a pitching process internally, so we had like everybody from the studio could pitch either an idea or an entire game or just something, they, a graphical style, what they thought were cool. And because we knew that at some point like Killzone was going to be, we had this franchise that was rolling, was making money and getting, you know, it was quite successful, but we, but like People we will get tired after yeah, a while. We course. want, and you know, we don't want to sort of like sort of fizzle out. Um, um, so we um, got a lot of people pitching concepts and everything from like you know relatively cool but predictable zombie shooters with a twist to like fantastic time traveling tales that were so expensive because every level would be in a different time zone and different position you could never make it. Um, and there was Horizon. Um, I think it was called Horizon from day one and it had a red-haired um, robot hunters in it. Um, and I think we first, we, we sort of shelved the idea because we were like, okay, there's a little bit too much out of our comfort zone, let's like be practical and do something that we know how to do because otherwise you know, we're just gonna go all in with all the chips and like, you know how, this, how stupid it is and you shouldn't be doing that. So we made like three other prototypes of different games and we were all like, meh, meh, and then like, you know, one by one we killed all of them and then we just went back to Horizon and, and made that one. And that one clicked. Yes. Um, so, would you say that the new tech features that were mm, developed for Horizon Zero Dawn, were they driven by design and by art, or are there any um, features that, like <coughs> vanity features, which were created by the uh, tech team, like just just to show off, just to, you know, just to, for the world to see how awesome we are, and you know? I think it's it's it it's mainly a good mix. We have a, a really like annoyingly pushy art director who says like, oh yeah, we're gonna have this new game, and like, yeah, I've got like a couple of ideas about how to make a tool set and delivers a 45 page document with like, you know, a description of the tool set and how everything should work and like a procedural placement system, which my fellows in the room have given a great talk about. But then he's really, really demanding. So that is like a lot of push from the creative side. But of course like the, um, the programmers very often, and we just had a really good talk in this room about like how to change your engine while you're uh, running. And engine programmers very often know stuff that needs to be done, and some of them that's like boring stuff, like how to completely re-architect a streaming system while we're actually making a game and doing that. Um, sometimes it's like vanity features, like uh, Michal Drebo is somewhere around here, was actually one of the guys on uh, Kills and Shadowfall, the team before, was really pushing to do PBR, even though the, the art team resisted. Uh, so I think it was like, you know, we, we push for the stuff that we think is right, and so do they, and then we sort of like meet in the middle, and then, and then in the end they say like, if we don't agree, we just do our thing anyway, a little bit. <laughs> sure. So uh, you mentioned uh, Killzone. Would you say that, uh, where are the roots of, of the engine? Is it like um, an effort that you could trace the a continuous <coughs> like a source code changes uh, history back to the day of of uh, the first kill zone, or maybe even further to yeah. to shell shock, or you would be surprised. No, I'm I'm not surprised. I like I found some bits in like I when I was like teenager, and they re and it software finally released the sources for uh, Quake Three, and that was like the first source code, larger source code, source code that I explored, and I found some bits which dated back to the the to Wolfenstein 3D. So it does not surprise me that. You have some like legacy code, so I think it's our with Jazz Grabber too. <laughs> really? Yeah, but I never threw anything away. So, <laughs> <laughs> like string classes, array classes, like the low-level stuff. Later on, that was uh, the framework was then called GFC or something, so game foundation classes, and then and we moved it over, and it, it just got constantly got refactored and refactored. Now it's like this monstrosity of a well, it's a very clean monstrosity, but it's a very large code base now. Uh, but that's when it started, and. And all the way through all the kill zones and everything, we never, well, we throw bits away, we deprecate systems, we refactor a lot and we spend a lot of but time. But you never cleaning. nuked everything no. and built no. from scratch? Okay. No. Mm. 
so um, how long has it been? I've, like, we've all, we've talked about this like off off stage, but uh, it's it's been a like a number of years uh, for before this uh, prototype of uh, Horizon turned into a game. How long did it take? Seven years. Seven years, and um, so. This means that much of the um, process uh, overlapped uh, the um, the process, uh, the development of, of uh, Killzone. Yes, I think we knew after Killzone 3, when that was our last PlayStation 3 title, that we wanted to do something different, but doing something really different and possibly a different genre and uh, something completely different is going to take time. Uh, so then we sort of. We, I think from the seven years, I must be honest, like about the one year was wasted on doing the other prototypes. And I think one year after, when we moved those aside, but that was the whole pitching, like changing process. So I think in Horizon about six years, but um, of actual work on that title. Uh, but anyway, so we, we did the whole pitching process and stuff and we knew like, this is gonna take time. We're not gonna take, we do our last kill zone and then our next game is going to be the next one because you won't have time for this like really long pre-production phase that you need to really form the IDs and all of the research you have to do. So um, we plan to do um, uh, Killzone as a launch title. So like we're early on in the cycle, then we'll have all of our technical systems up to a spot where at least they're ready for next gen so we don't have to do a generation switch and our own internal stuff at the same time. And that gave about three years of time for the uh, development team. Like there were like 20 people on it or something quite small for our staff. I think it grew with like, started with six, seven people and it grew to about 20. Um, and then at the end of uh, Killzone, they all, and those 20 people all of a sudden got like 180 people added to their team. <laughs> so you can imagine that was a little bit of a bumpy ride. But at least they had like three years of like um, uh, formulating ideas, like two and a half years of, of getting their stuff together. Um, Interesting. Um, so um, would you, is, what would be, like the most important issues that you encountered making the switch from a first person shooter <coughs> to um to a third person uh, third person uh, perspective game and of course like there are mm, all the issues that um come from the fact that it's it is an open world game now and and so on of, of course i um i imagine that like the the the, in the switch of perspective uh, on its own Creates, uh, opens uh, a new, uh, you know, a new um, perspective on, of problems and. Yeah, I think that of course there's a lot of technical things that we had to fix. Like uh, we did Lua scripting, and that was not going to fly anymore. Also, the way that we scripted stuff was like not going to work in a, so like both the language and the methodology of a lot of things didn't work anymore. Shifting perspective to third person was really different. But I think the biggest, the actually the biggest thing that we. Um, the biggest problem we had was staffing. We had a team that was good at making first person shooters. They had a lot of love and passion for how to make something different, but we didn't have the people with the experience to do what we needed to do. So we started specifically headhunting for the key people on the team. We started painting a picture like, this is the type of people we need. We need quest designers, we need a world designer who knows actually how to do that. We need about five writers maybe at peak and we at least need a lead writer. And you know we couldn't deal and um, with technical things you can learn and you can sort of evaluate how far you are along in the process of like, you know, managing your goals and you can, you can be really schedule about it or can just like, you know, sort of like, you know, be a bit hand wavy, but you, there's all sorts of ways to measure that. But like finding the right people for your team to make a transition to something better, be it in the same genre or maybe if you want to innovate something in your own genre, that's the, the hardest part, I think. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. Um. All right, I um, made a little community survey <laughs> among uh, programmers uh, um, in Poland and asked them about uh, things that they might want to know about the technology of Horizon Zero Dawn. So, for instance, uh, one person asked, how do you handle the LOD for distant meshes? Uh, are they generated? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the guy, of course. Um, how they are? How are they generated? How do you mm, handle them? Um, yeah, I think we discussed this briefly in the, the whole way today. I mean, it's um, we have a very heavy outsourced pipeline, so we hardly make any assets ourselves. But we are very particular when with with how we outsource. So we make mock-up three D models so that we know exactly that everything. 
we used to just give dimensions, but we thought not precise enough. So we're very control our process, process very directly, but so we get s about seven LOD steps back for every individual building block from like highest probably being a couple of thousand triangles to like almost boxes. Um, those things get um, uh, collapsed in groups over distance so the artist can have some control over that. So like for example at um, 100 meters or something, large groups of them will collapse into one single mesh. Um, at that moment, we'll also make a texture atlas so they can all be rendered with the same shader. Um, that was the sort of stuff we already did for Killzone, but one also the type of things we didn't find out until very, very late uh, in development that it wasn't going to cut it. I mean, it, it did work for a lot of uh, cases and it was not optimal. Uh, it was really good for a first-person shooter. Uh, what we had problems with was uh, faraway settlements. Like we had good LOD systems like for faraway terrain, but have, there's a very big city in, uh, in Horizon called uh, uh, Meridian. And how matter, no matter how you cut it, even we, we collapsed the mesh, you put simply gone on it to reduce the triangles further. It just was way too much. So then in the end, what, we, what somebody did is they hijacked our, um, the output from our indirect lighting solution where we voxelize the entire world into cubes of I think 10 by 10 or 25 by 25 centimeters and we use that to do indirect lighting calculations and then we bake that back into a, a, a structure to, to do all the indirect lighting. And he took that sort of like mon Minecraft-like version of the entire world and started tracing polygons over it, um, making a very rough, ugly mesh, but we had all of the properties from the G-buffer in there because that's what we get out of the voxelization. And that started making really coarse meshes that have sort of the same, the right silhouette and um, color and G-buffer properties, um, making them into ridiculously cheap, really ugly meshes that we'd only show far off. Um, now, if you look at Horizon, you can see these things because they're really quite ugly, mm -hmm. but mostly they're so far away that you don't notice. But that yeah. did result in like this large list of like, these are stuff we need to look at for the next game because it's... Okay, and but that doesn't <coughs> mean that they are imposters. They are not sprites, they are actually yep. meshes. They're meshes, yeah. Okay. Um. It's difficult to imposter a city when you can walk around it. Like. Yeah, yeah, that's the point of my question. Um, okay, so... Um, with all those things that happen on the screen, I'm sure that there is some visibility testing uh, going on that is uh, pr potentially interesting to us. Um, it's well, it's quite interesting. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science. We just use a reprojected version of the. Uh, do we reproject the depth buffer? No, we take the projection of the bounding box of like objects. We project it back to the position of where it was on the previous frame, we test it against the depth buffer, and we make a hierarchy out of that, so we have clusters of objects and then subclusters, and um, we have a bunch of async compute shaders that run during, as soon as we know in the frame uh, what we need to have, um, and we do the same thing for spotlights and stuff, we kick off async compute uh, queries from the CPU and the GPU then handles those things. Um, so that's a bit like uh, manual uh, occlusion queries, sort of, but with reprojection. Yes, manual conclusion queries, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's one of those depth-based buffer techniques, and we run it at a very, up to a very fine resolution. I think we, we call, depending on the, the cost measure, like up to individual building blocks, or quite small meshes can get occluded. Mm -hmm. um, we never actually got it fail safe. So if you run around in the game, you can actually see false occlusion uh, somewhere around the corner, so. All right. Um. Um, so there have been from from like the pr other presentations that um, the guys have done and the other the other presentations that were like the GDC and so on. We've seen that there um, have been some significant changes in tool in tooling, uh, like the introduction of the editor. Mm -hmm. So um, w was that a bumpy ride to get that to to get the team acquainted with that and to get this you know out to the, to the not at all. <laughs> No, I think we had to, we, 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 we understood that the way that we were making tools, we had, I think, what a lot of people have, like a collection of Python scripts, C-sharp, some of them WinForm, some of them WPF, old MFC tools. Um, like, we had this, like, red back collection of stuff, and where everybody was, like, jealously looking at something like Unreal, which everything's nicely integrated, and has a nice philosophy, and we're like, okay, we need to have something like that, but we don't want to use exactly that, but, like, something middle ground, doesn't have to be that flashy. So we started, a, well we also noticed that um, although C-sharp is a really nice language, that it 
we, it caused a lot of duplication of work. We have really good systems for multi-threading, for vectors, for color conversion, like you name it, we have a lot of this stuff in our engine because we, you know, as I said, we, we've always been refactoring, improving it, so uh, we said like, you know, and also C-sharp, you tend to have this thing where certain tools programmers felt like they were C-sharp programmers instead of just like part of the team, and this was like, um, there was a bit of a split, so uh, we also had an in-game tools framework where you could like, you know, have profilers and debugging modes and stuff, and that was quite simple. You just had like a window, and like a windowing system with coordinates, and you can put text, you can draw lines, and that led to all sorts of programs making the richest debugging modes ever. So like a lot of the programmers felt perfectly comfortable writing tools as long as it was something that you could give to them that they would know how to use, and they could use all the things that they um, that they were familiar with without having to jump over to like, oh, now I'm going to learn the C-sharp framework and there's all of these like abstraction things and you have to communicate with a different process. So we set out to create a new tool set that was like very familiar written in C++. We, are, we use Qt for the UI, at least now I'm slowly pushing it out. But, um, and then we had to rebuild everything we had from scratch. So we had exactly like the sort of things where Everybody was bitching about our old stuff. It was horrible and slow and ugly, and you wouldn't want to, you know, just you know, give that to your friends and and it's like horrible things. But when you gave them the new editor and it missed one sim simple feature, I mean, they got Stockholm syndrome and they didn't want to let go of it. So it was this like really long list of like, and you know, you have to take it seriously. I mean, you could just like turn off the old editor and be mean to your artist, but you have to. I mean, they had very good reasons. Like, yeah, multi-select doesn't work, and go like, fuck, it's a really annoying feature. But yeah. Uh, difficult to write, but you can imagine people, you know, would get, um, uh, you know, the work would slow down. But after the initial hump, I think we've like we've created a massive amount of tools because also the entire team could help. So I think at some point, like we maybe had like 12 people programming tools. That was like three times bigger than the tools team itself. Uh, but yeah, everybody could help out, and um, so that really worked well for a large part. So that means that it encouraged uh, more contributions from uh, like programmers who are not uh, like desig designated to programmers, right? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so you mentioned previously already in the interview that um, that uh, you have this I indirect lighting uh, this, uh, data structure. So uh, how does the global illumination uh, Lightning component work. I'll like try to big <laughs> picture. <laughs> I'll try to give it, keep it short. So that it's yeah. Although yeah. it's quite intricate, but um, largely we voxelize the entire world using our normal rendering pipeline. So you get like very fat voxels with all of your normal G buffer properties. Then we take those sort of like we bricks of voxels. We bounce light around it with all of your normal math for bouncing light around and sparse voxel arc trees and stuff and everything. Um, then we have a regular grid of um, uh, of probes, basically, in what basis is it at that moment? I forgot the basis. Anyway, we have a, we have a regular grid of probes, uh, which is too expensive to and too big, of course, to use in a game. And then we find um, uh, for every column in the world the four most distinct um, values of those probes, and we store that in four uh, textures. And I think that. I forgot the basis that we switched to because we switched a couple of times like very late in the day. Basically, so we have four height fields that describe four planes that go through the world and the lighting information there. And because that's quite compact, all those textures can be compressed. Uh, you can di directly apply it. So in, then at runtime, we just do in our combined lighting pass, there's just like a, a full screen pass. We just uh, get the 3D position, sample all of that data and uh, combine it with all the real time lights. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. Nice. Um. So, um, it's actually the first game that we shipped without light maps. We were like, every game, <laughs> we're like, we're not going to ship with light maps anymore. They suck. And then, like, all the UVing stuff and all the pipeline issues, we finally made it. Cool. So, uh, if we're st like still on indirect lighting, then um, some people have suggested that they uh, sort of had, we were under the impression that um, s screen space reflections are a bit dialed down compared to Killzone 4. Like maybe there is some <laughs> object filtering involved or something, uh, or, it's just an, or, or maybe it's just a, like an art direction decision. Nah, it's just expensive, and like <laughs> the view distances are really, really, really far. Like in Killzone, you couldn't see that far. So, yeah, it was like one of those yeah. things. Makes sense, of course. Yeah. Um, um, many people are impressed by the excellent loading times. Mm -hmm. um, is is there any magic trick involved? Get a couple of people on your team with like a loading time fetish. 
And so they basically just profile the crap out of it. And yeah, we have we have a couple of really good uh, profiling tools again in the editor, so we can see all the layout. And um, there's a bunch of guys, myself included, who are always like really adamant for good loading times. The one thing that we did that was quite funny is that on Killzone, we also went for like with these big chunks of levels, so like like a 150 megabyte file with like a level section, a 30 megabyte file with a, a character in it, like to, to optimize loading times. But that also means that in all of those files, we duplicated assets a lot. And we're, we couldn't be doing it anymore. The disk just wouldn't fit. And we sort of reverted. And that was also really horrible for workflow, because every time, like in people's iterative loop, they were constantly building these big pack files. And it's just like all the I.O. overhead for small changes got really, really big. So we decided to go the other way and like completely ditch all of that. So we went for like the smallest files possible, everything that the artist worked with, or they're like you know, one binary file for one source file. So that means like, um, ironically, we have file. We had we shipped with two hundred and sixty thousand files on the disk, um, but we made our own virtual file system, so it ended up being three files to the operating system. And internally, there we we have our own file management system. So the only thing that OS would see is like three reads to open it, and then for that moment on, just read calls with different offsets. Um, ironically, some of the files are so small that the file names are bigger than the file contents themselves. Like, a, a texture for us is only a, a small binary file with a texture header and some properties, and the offset of where you can find the streaming data, and that's like 120 bytes. But then it's got like some way models, characters, Aloy, third person, active, blah, 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 and it's like yeah, it's a 220 path character path name with 120 byte file. Anyway, to answer your question, it's just a matter of like, um, when we stream something in, we have this huge amount of files, we have a graph of everything that links to everything. So when we package the disk, we know we basically save the linearization to when we actually package. So it's in nobody's workflow when they develop, but only when we package stuff up, we know in which we can follow the graph so we can see what's going to be loaded and where the boundaries are of the streaming system. Where it, uh, So we make islands out of them, we linearize them on disk. Um, so then, um, yeah, when we load stuff in, we just like find all those linear islands, we sort them according to our best guess of the LBA on the disk, which we don't physically know, but we get quite close to it, and then we load everything in. But does that mean that, uh, I mean, some of the assets that you need to, mm, you need to have, <coughs> like, they, they need to be like shared between those, those islands, right? It's not like, uh, mm. since, since you said that you have this, um, you had the issue of duplication of data, yeah. I, I, I assume that this is because you were optimizing for uh, seeking on the drive also. Yeah. So if, if, like, if you went away from this um, duplication of, of, of this data, then, then do you have this, um, the issue of like seeking back and forth? Yeah. To yeah, so we have a is little bit. Is this still a big, big, big issue on, 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 on the current generation of consoles? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, a seek might cost you like 20 milliseconds or something. Uh, so it's really expensive. But short seeks are better than long seeks. So if you s approximately try to read in linear fashion over your disk, it's still a lot faster. And the so other. It's just like a good enough approach. Yes. And also the other thing we did is, as we said, like we always used to do this thing where you load linear chunks of data and also to avoid memory fragmentation because otherwise you get things that your game eventually crashed. And that's what we also get rid of. We only store every asset on the disk once, and we load them in memory once, and we made a custom uh, heap, which is, again, something not, not rocket science based on the normal best practices of making heaps, like uh, bin sizes and stuff to avoid fragmentation. But uh, we made a specific heap and put all of our streaming assets on it. And we've never seen a crash uh, because of fragmentation. Cool. <laughs> So we also <laughs> store all the assets in memory one. So the, 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 the streaming is much more fine-grained, and it happens all the time. So when you're running through the world, we're constantly loading in individual lot levels of meshes and individual samples. And uh, so it's much more like a, a current trick, a, a constant trickle in the background. Um, OK, fair enough. Um, so um, I assume everyone um, has already heard that um, Kojima Productions is also now a, um, a consumer of your engine. So um, uh, many people excited and <coughs> on their toes for Death Stranding. Um, and uh, of course, the, there, there has been talk of, of uh, you guys at Guerrilla cooperating with, uh, with uh, Kojima Productions. Um, how would you say is that cooperation coming along? Are there like cultural differences? Um, a surprisingly more, um, uh, I was expecting a little bit more like this lost in translation thing where it's going to be really awkward and weird, but it's been surprisingly uh, good. They, they're like, 
the Kojima production team is much more Western. Um, they feel much more Western than you would think. They're incredibly thorough and they're very skilled. They're just like happen to be without an engine for a while because they quit their publisher. And they have a director above them who's, who knows exactly what he wants and doesn't, isn't afraid to tell them so. Um, so it's been, and it's been a really good cultural match um, because yeah, I mean, they're a really good team. Like you don't very often meet a team of like equal or higher caliber than your own that all of a sudden uh, wants to cooperate with you because they have a lot of benefit with that. Um, and they're just like, yeah, really uh, fanatical, enthusiastical, talented game developers. So uh, yeah, we've we also like, we have had a couple of visits there. They visited us and every time we go there, everybody goes drinking like, hey, sake. You know? <laughs> like, uh, so, um, have they already like been contributing? Have, has there been input from like to the code base already from their side? There's been some code that got uh, back, but it's mainly for us now to give them a lot because, of course, we have a code base that's like mm -hmm. 20 years old and has a lot of features, and they have a mission and a deadline. Uh, but we've taken some stuff back. There's also lots of ID sharing going back, lots of conversations, especially about you know lighting systems and code architecture and stuff. So, yeah, interesting. Um, so have. Continuing on, on this um, track, uh, does uh, uh, Kojima-san's uh, plans or requests um, already like m affected decision, technical decisions on the engine level? Like you, you said, you, you, they have a mission, they have a deadline. Uh, yeah. does, does, did that already impact uh, the, the way you yeah. work? <laughs> like we have no official obligations towards them. We we said we set up the structure, and now we have like a couple of full-time uh, translators and project managers, and we have people oh, who interesting. yeah we have Slack channels, so we're constantly chatting with them, and we have like bug databases and video conference calls like five times a week. So it's like it's really quite intense, but we have no obligations. But they did put a lot of stuff on our agenda, like you know we had this like indirect lighting system we're talking about, and one of the guys there is like I said they're very thorough. Says like so I took an Amitsuba render, like I made a reference render your lighting system and now I've found out like if I change this thing I think and I found like something is divided by pi here in the code like could you explain to me what that was and then people go like whoops like <laughs> <laughs> but I mean and then they fix I mean they, they find stuff and they're really as like they said that they're really thorough um, but they so they have a different way of looking at and it's really good I mean if you're making an engine you don't very often work so intensely with other people who are you know, of the same skill level or better in this case. And then, you know, they, they have a different, either used to different things and they want to get to the bottom of why it's not what they expect. Um, so it's also really refreshing, I think, to like get, you know, different eyes on your own, on your own work. Um, yeah, for sure. We also have um, a Horizon ship with four and a half hours of cutscenes, which was more than, two and a half hours more than we that was in our planning. Um, we just found a bunch of cutscenes. We made really good tools to make mock-up cutscenes, which ended up like making lots of mock-up cutscenes by the designers themselves that they didn't tell anybody. So production didn't know about it. And then when we finally started looking at all of those 40 hours of content, we found all of these cutscenes that like, everybody's like, what's this? It's like, yeah, well, I made that with our tools. And then, you know, we found out um, that we had to do it later. So we know we had a big problem with our uh, cutscene pipeline. And at some point, Kojima guys can say, like, guys, you're cutting a pipeline. We have a couple of issues. And then um, they said, like, well, yeah, we have some issues as well. And said, like, well, we have a presentation about it. And then it shows, like, a 50-page PowerPoint presentation with all sorts of, like, stuff. And you go, like, I think we can learn something from these guys. And they have some really oh, good... Oh, yeah, with, with the cutscenes from, yes. <laughs> from Kojima. They have a lot of experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so are you personally excited for Death Stranding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some of it. It's... Uh, yeah, the internet is going crazy over it. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit now, um, let's talk about the development of, of programmers and <coughs> and like the future of programming maybe since like mm -hmm. this is what what we do. Uh, so drawing from your many years of experience, um, how would you, what would you say is the most effective way to uh, further uh, develop one's skills like? maybe aside of actually like writing code, because mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty obvious. What would you say if, um, I, I mean, I heard a programmer say that I haven't learned anything at conferences uh, in 10 years time. And you know, uh, if you don't learn at conferences, then when, where, where do you learn? How would you say, how do you like encourage your, the, the people who work with you to, to get better? 
I think, I mean, writing code is the most important thing. Uh, reviewing code or having your code reviewed and being really good at being reviewed and finding the right people in your company who want to review your code. Because you can learn so much by getting reviewed and listening. If you're getting reviewed and you go like, yeah, 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 fine, I'll fix that and not actually fix it or like, you know, you don't actually listen, um, then, you know, that's all wasted. But if you have really skilled people around you, look at them, ask them for advice. And um, lots of people like, you know, who are, who are talented like to give advice. They like sharing knowledge. So um, that's always one. And then I was like, for, I think for the younger programmers, just like writing a lots and lots of code and rewriting your own code. And if you see an easier way to do the same thing you've done like a couple of months before, then rewrite it and do it better. Don't hop onto the new thing, but like keep on like brushing up your skills. I think when you're much further along, I think a lot of the, uh, your programming skills are much more like, are you doing the right thing? It's like you, you can actually type the code, but are you, are you attacking the problem in the most fundamental way? And I think then like, getting into you know, reading a lot of papers, reading at work from others, going to conferences and hearing about what other people have done. It's much more about like finding exactly the right thing. Because you can mean, um, if you get a very high level task and you make like a, um, uh, an indirect lighting system, you know, having to iterate on the wrong one like three times in a row is gonna cost you like three times like five months to iterate. So if you save one iteration, you've saved five months of code. So, um, but that's like, you know, when you get more senior, I guess. Sure. So, um, if you had um, an aspiring programmer, uh, like getting into <coughs> the industry, do you think that, uh, what would, would you say that they should learn uh, apart from C++ and HLSL, which are like, like the cornerstones of, of, the, of the games industry? What, what do you think is some, some technology that is looming ahead and that should be taken seriously? <laughs> I think you just start with C++ and <laughs> HLSL is like depends on if you want to be a graphics coder. I think it makes sense to understand how GPUs work because that is useful for a large, a, a growing uh, foundation, a growing group of people like our AI coders are, even though they haven't got their stuff running on GPUs, they're really looking at how they can get all of their voxelization, all their real-time nav mesh generation on GPUs. There's more and more things that are moving there, but I think the most fundamental thing in you know C++ and what I was, uh, um, advise people when they are starting out. It's like, just copy a game that you like. Um, you have to find something that you're passionate about to do. Um, because if you set up like this, you know, people could go like, oh, I'll set up a pet project, and then they start making something that they're not excited on getting when it's finished. And it's really hard to motivate yourself if you're not excited. It's like, I, I know some of the best people, like, Jessica Rabbit was a little bit clone-ish, if you look back at it. Like, hey, why doesn't Sonic run on this platform? Well, we'll make something like it. Like, <laughs> Oh yeah. So, um, okay, so mm, we are mm, getting to um, the end of the questions I have prepared. So maybe you could tell us um, if you remember, mm, like right now, anything. And if anything comes to mind uh, in the vein of funny or scary situations, like an anecdote. <laughs> with, with a <laughs> <laughs> I can do like magic tricks out of <laughs> nowhere. <laughs> All right then. Then then perhaps we can just uh, start taking questions from, from the audience. Um, are there any questions from you guys? Okay. Uh, you have your own engine, right? Uh, uh, is it your engine prepared uh, is it for mobile? Or only for people A? Uh, <laughs> Because I have seen um, that um, Android Engine yeah. tried uh, at some point uh, to uh, give uh, developers uh, their engine to create games from mm -hmm. mobiles, right? Uh, how, how about your engine? Do, do you consider your engine um, uh, um, a, a tool to, to make games from mobiles? Yes, we can. I would just, um, I should have had to laugh initially because like I'm mobile, like, that's not what we're targeting. But um, I think uh, we're not targeting mobile at all. We're now just targeting like, you know, uh, current generation consoles and then the higher uh, spectrum of that. Like the type of, it's really good if you want to make a game that uses all of the cores, even the, the, the six, the seven core on the piece four. If that's important to you, that sort of stuff, like gets everything out of it. That's a good, that's what's a good engine for. It's made for big workflows and big games. We don't have like a create new level button. Like it's like creating a world is really difficult for us. We only do it once every like three years, four years. So 
Um, but performance-wise, it, it can do that because we're we're so performance adamant. I think better than Unreal. If I may, well, I've heard from others who actually use Unreal in their engine. Um, and we had, I mean, it got ported to uh, PSP to make uh, Kills on Liberation. It was the same engine, but then with changes for the PSP, it got ported to PS Vita uh, for uh, Kills and Mercenary, um, and that shared like. Everything except the render and the sound system, basically only those systems were rewritten. So the, the, core, the core of the engine is quite flexible and would make use of all of the extra cores that uh, mobile has nowadays. Uh, but of course, we don't have a, uh, a Vulkan renderer backend at the moment, which we might have soon again. But um, So yeah, I think in design it is, but yeah, we don't have anything at the moment. Well, we don't get a lot of people who have a lot of experience in Unity or in Unreal. We do get some of that, but then all, very often we also get the people who are who are going coming to us because they want to move away from that because they feel that they're doing too much in a third-party engine. They spend a lot of time like upgrading the engine to a new version, and very often like you know their employer has a different frame of mind of how important all these things are, and that's why I think. Um, as a company, we try to, I mean, this is very an obvious choice. Like, we speak at conference, and I mean, we try to attract the type of people who like inventing things and sharing things. And that's why we uh, share a lot of the stuff that we invent, uh, because by showing, you know, the type of people who work there, you attract the type of people who want to work there. And those, those are the kinds of people, yeah, who want to do inventions themselves and, and stuff. Um, I think still it's very difficult for anybody to get people. Like, the industry is just is growing, and there's like only so many talented people. So. Um, but I think that the particularly the switching from something like Unreal Unity to what we are making is not a not a very big issue. Uh, next question. <laughs> uh, uh, when you decide uh, that uh, enough is enough, mm -hmm. I mean you can uh, uh, upgrade your game, add new things mm -hmm. forever, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when you decide that okay, maybe it's not perfect, but we <coughs> it's over. <coughs> Well, because we have a very big team and the pipelines are very long, like the outsourcing pipeline, when you stuff something into one end, it takes like four months to something to fall out the other end. So it's not something like a very, it's not like, and I remember we had discussions with when we were shipping Jazz 2, when we were talking about funny anecdotes where we actually, at some point we were just fixing and fixing it and we were like, okay, shouldn't we just ship it? All these bugs are really insignificant. And then we'd like, Aryan, our managing director started shouting to Mark Rain from Epic and they started having a fallout and sh it got really nasty. And at some point we went to Tim, uh, uh, what is he now? He's still director? No, like, uh, the boss of uh, Epic. And we said like, yeah, we're having an argument with Mark. Can we just like ship this game? He's like, yeah, just put it on the internet. And we uploaded it while Mark was on holiday and that's how we released our game. <laughs> it's like, we don't do it like that anymore. We have to at least know a couple of months in advance. But we do have this trickle where like coders go like, I think we can still put this in. And I think we pride ourselves in, in like um, allowing really ridiculous stuff until very late. Um, but I think it just comes with experience. At some point you think, like, ah, that might blow up in our face. We'll make a branch for that one and we'll try to do it there. And if it doesn't blow up and we have enough testers available, then you know we'll do it. And I know that that man over there th thought we were crazy. They were switching to GGX somewhere like four months before release from a different lighting model. Uh, we had to redo a whole bunch of art, but then um, I think it's just like, yeah, common sense is the best answer. Talk. Um, I'm afraid my question is going to be from a uh, game content creator point of view, and um, it's regarding uh, development of core systems and tools whilst game creators are working simultaneously with you. Uh, currently, our studio is facing a lot of those problems in which work gets scrapped and redone a lot of times. Yeah. How did you? How did you? That's a tough one. I think we try to make sure that the coders will never impose work on the artists to redo work 
unless it's really necessary, but there are exceptions. If there's something like an X amount of work needs to be done because otherwise it holds everything back, um, then it needs to be done. But even then we try like our best to do um, conversion tools or anything we can do. But that, uh, definitely for Horizon, yeah, we went from Lua scripting, where basically all the scripts are just whatever the, whatever the designer did to a completely node-based stuff that was compiled down to C++. And I was like, there's no way to make that compatible. Everything had to be redone. But then also, like, when you see those sort of things coming, you try to schedule your content creation pipeline around it so you don't make stuff that needs to be uh, thrown away later because you, you know what is going to be thrown away. But it's always going to be a difficult uh, thing. I think we managed to to throw away very little. Um, but it's, it, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Ah. Uh, did the transition to a new engine, like the decision we are going to create something from, not from scratch, but pretty much reinvent the wheel easy and is it worth, I'm sure it's worth it in the end. Yeah. Because uh, well, I think, um, although we repeated it a couple of times, like people just don't, when they say like, the new engine thing keeps coming up. Yeah. But for us, Horizon wasn't out of line with what we always done. We've like, we're constantly always all the time, refactoring, cleaning. Um, and so this is this ha this engine iteration has seen more changes than before, um, but there, it, was, it wasn't an option to, to not do that because we were making a completely different game. So um, so I think, yeah, it was not a choice. It wasn't, there, was, there was no option. I mean, we were making this game. We did not have an engine that could do that. So like, you know, could you please make an engine to make the game we want to make? Thank you. That was sort of like how the discussion went. Okay, so uh, you said that you get rid of Lua scripting. Yes. Uh, and what's the replacement? Um, C++, but there's a catch. <laughs> no, the, um, we, have a, we made a visual. First, we had Lua scripts in Killzone 1 and 2, I think. And then in Killzone 3, we made a uh, tool in C Sharp that made a sort of a state machine layout because we started to notice that all of the designers are making state machines anyway. So we made a visual tool with like build small blocks and transitions, and that basically would output Lua. So then a lot of designers wouldn't have to write Lua anymore, and they could write the contents of these blocks and make new blocks themselves. And then, um, so basically, but it was still, uh, the interface was Lua. Um, and then with, with um, uh, or Killzone Shadowfall, I think, yeah, we started working on our node graph system, which we st started to do for sound, which is just a graph-based thing, a little bit like blueprints, but in that time our editor was far, far uglier. Um, and way less user friendly. Uh, and what we did is like all of those nodes in those things, which is like math nodes and things and everything, which basically a, made a sound script. Uh, we compiled it down to C++. So all of the nodes were represented by a bit of C++ code. Everything was compiled uh, and linked. And then we just load in the, the sound as a sound program as a DLL. And then for Horizon, we extended that whole system with a very fancy editor. It looks way better than one in Unreal. Um, it's still far from as user friendly. Um, and we also have uh, nested state machines in those. So we have a combination of state machines, uh, uh, com um, data flow, so you can do like math operations easy, and also calling functions into the editor, uh, variables, and all, all the sort of stuff. And that's what the designers now use. And we use that both for as a replacement. Again, it was one of those systems. It started out as uh, deprecating an old piece of middleware and making our own sound system that grew into something versatile enough to be a scripting system and um, now we're actually looking at taking that same system and um, uh, changing our animation system, which is also like blend trees and state machines and stuff, and extending it with the nuts and bolts that we need to replace that piece of middleware as well. Uh, we have also have plans to take that same thing and then start attacking the rigger workflow with that, because riggers also, they complain about the node graph, in, the dependency graph in Maya, and it's really slow, and they want to use Fabric because it's much better. And then, uh, So slowly, like every iteration, we're building on it. But so in the end, Lua got replaced by natively executed C++ code. Um, I can recommend that. It's really fast. We went from like maybe one, two milliseconds sometimes on, on Killzone, on the main CPU core. We didn't do much in parallel because it was running script and it was calling into the engine. We lose two milliseconds of, of like CPU time into like nothingness, like ridiculously 
stupid stuff. And I think now we're in, in, in the big city in, uh, in Horizon where we have the most amount of stuff going on. It's like 0.1% of the frame running 500 scripts at the same time because most of them do nothing. So. And how many scripts are in one DLL? Like all, all in one or DLL per, <coughs> per each, each, each script? Yeah. Now, during development, what we do is we, um, but unfortunately, there are, we have like tens of thousands of those uh, programs uh, in memory. Um, unfortunately, the PS4 has a limit of loading 511 DLLs, I think. Um, so what we do is we uh, pack everything into one big uh, uh, DLL that you get from the server, and then only the stuff that you've modified locally gets basically layered on top of that. And then event what we do when we ship the final game, we just ship uh, the main game at one uh, DLL with everything in it. And then we do like very heavy, we let the linker do those link time optimizations and it makes it smaller and faster even. Uh, but in the end we ship one. Okay, thank you. No. Any other questions? Okay, hi. Thanks for making Horizon, it's a great game. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. How do you handle the dynamic weather and lighting conditions when you have baked light probes? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, we bake light at four times a day, uh, and then we linearly interpolate. Um, that's about it, right? <laughs> it's, it's not very advanced. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I was thinking of like, like in, any interesting details, but that's about it. Yeah, we stream in the different times of day, so. But the streaming is quite fast. But if you're in photo mode and you're like, you're, you're go around with the time slider, you can actually sometimes see late streaming of the uh, indirect lighting, so. Um, and also the weather. Um, uh, yeah, the weather, of course, okay, the weather is like a larger system of like uh, lots of its particles, but of course it also uh, dynamically changes the reflection cubes and stuff and everything, but that is a different part of the lighting equation, so it doesn't, uh, I'm thinking there's a sky occlusion in there. It does, I mean, of course, the indirect lighting has a sky occlusion factor and direction, so that, that that's has interacts with the fact that there's weather and it's overcast and you get a different response, but uh, it doesn't actually change the indirect lighting uh, itself. No, I, there's one detail. We actually the um, all of the the all of the light source, like the direct lighting from stuff like um, torches and stuff in the night, they're baked separately, so we can turn them on more dynamically, uh, in regards of the bounce light that comes from them. Okay, and what about the indirect backload? Another indirect. Mm-hmm. You have some, I don't know. You relied some cube maps or something mm -hmm. for that? I don't know. Okay. I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> As I said, I'm not a graphics programmer. <laughs> I would have to ask. Um. Hello. Uh, so my question is a bit more casual. Uh, mm -hmm. that, like, if we move forward in years, there is a launch of PlayStation Five. Mm -hmm. Can we expect the game will have from you the same engine as Horizon, the new one? Yes. So you planning to like. Do this forever. It. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it worked for us for 20 years. It's working fine. Um, <laughs> we don't see any. I think also like no programmer in. There was this thing about um, uh, the previous talk and said like, yeah, the programmers always want to rewrite the engine from scratch. I think I don't know many programmers looking at two of them over there. Like I don't know any, know any programmers in our office who would like to start from scratch. That means like we've built all this great stuff over the years and we have to leave it all behind and start from nothing. Um, I think if, if there's, maybe as a, uh, I don't know uh, what your profession is, your technical leader, but if, if people on your code team start to have a very large desire to write the engine from scratch, there's probably something wrong with the engine. Um, it's a good sign that you maybe should start rewriting parts of it um, to make sure that they don't fall behind. We do sometimes have these things like, oh, if we could just do without like physics middleware, that would be so awesome. So we have some desires to like write components from scratch. Um, but not the entirety. Okay, thank you. So I think we're, uh, we've uh, run out of time, so we'll, we'll have to call it a day at this point. So uh, a big round for, of applause again, please. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.